Uh, we prayed this morning, uh, our worship team and sound AV people, we prayed this morning and, and we thank God for uh, the blessing that that he gave, that he, he knew the world would be messed up if he just left it with men, so he <laughs> gave women. I'm, I gotta tell you, they would have been messed up, okay? And God brought balance to the world when he gave us women. As Genesis says in the old uh, King James, when he gives a help meet, and I thank God for my wife, the mom that she is for my kids, uh, how she nurtures them, because I'm not a nurturer, I'm, not, I'm incapable of that, but she nurtures them in ways that I can't, and God put us together for that, that very reason, one of many. So to all you moms out there, to all you people who have moms out there, that means everybody, uh, give thanks for the woman that has raised you. I know sometimes we have some difficult relationships with our moms. But that's okay. We can still praise God in the midst of those difficulties. And thank him for the opportunity to, to love. As we said over the past 12 weeks before uh, the book of Galatians, when we went through Thessalonians, that following Jesus produces a counterculture holy way of life that responds to hostility of difficult situations, that responds to disagreement with love and generosity because of the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Well, we're here to talk about uh, Galatians. I have a few more announcements before we get into that, but I would like you to open up your book, uh, your Bible, or your devices to Galatians chapter 1. Uh, in preparation for that, we're going to start reading at verse 10 in just a minute here. Uh, we have, uh, if you've been paying attention to the bulletin, if you've been paying attention to the Facebook page, if you've been paying attention at all, and you're a regular part, I, mean, I gotta clarify this, and you're a regular attender, regular part of this church, you, you know that there are some things going on in the life of this church. Our annual yard sale's coming up this weekend, on Friday and Saturday, and if you would, we could use all the help we could get on Wednesday evening, uh, bringing everything from the various locations that they are stored at to the church and dumping it into the tent. Thursday, if you would like to, right? Can I say that? Okay, she's saying yes. Linda doesn't want to set up the gym all by herself. So Thursday, if you don't have anything to do and you'd like to sort through some stuff, get it out on all the tables and hanged up and all that stuff, you can come Thursday and help set up. That would be greatly appreciated. Friday and Saturday, tell all your friends, your neighbors, anybody, to come down here. Uh, our yard sale is unique in yard sales, I just gotta tell you, because we just take whatever people can get, okay? And if they can't, we say God bless you and take it anyway, okay? We're not here to make money off people, we're here to help people. Now we do raise money, okay, for men's and women's ministries and things like that. Whatever comes in, comes in. But you need to know that this is a ministry as well. Uh, we will shop with people. We will help them find the things that they need. And we'll take whatever money they have or none at all. And we'll say, God bless you with the, uh, the abundance uh, that our church has had. We share with you now. Okay? And that is a good ministry. Okay? So please uh, be ready for that. Also this weekend on Friday and Saturday, uh, there's a men's conference in Tri-Cities. We're going to bless the men's conference held in Tri-Cities every year. Uh, it is taking place uh, usually uh, at uh, Faith Assembly, right outside our building, just across the lawn. This year it's taking place at the track. And if you'd like, uh, I have sent out Facebook notices, emails, all those things about going to this men's conference. If you're uh, uh, a male, you can be a student as well, student with half price. If you're a male and you'd like to go to this men's conference, there's a ton of activities that take place all day Friday and Saturday, but there are three sessions where we worship and hear some great speakers um, pour into us, and uh, Friday night at 7 o'clock is the first one, Saturday morning and Saturday afternoon are the other two. Uh, there are other activities, motorcycle ride, off-road motorcycle ride, bicycle ride, golf tournament, uh, you can learn how to throw a tomahawk. Archery? I don't know if there's archery. Last year they had archery, but it was not archery like you think, Martin. It was archery like paintball, but you shoot arrows at other people. <laughs> I haven't figured this out yet, apparently. Uh, they have big blunts 
phone in, but it's a research phone and you, you, you got so many arrows that you, you run around a course and you see it, your phone in. So if that's your sort of thing, you can come do that. Or if you want to learn how to throw a tomahawk or you want to eat some good barbecue and food truck food, there's lots of stuff. Would you please, 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 we need to register, uh, is it this Friday or Saturday? The last day to register is Thursday. Uh, I need to know if you'd like to go. We have about seven guys signed up already. We'd love to have as many as possible. If you'd like to go, please talk to me. It is $95 for the weekend. Uh, and I know that's a lot of money. Our men's ministry has offered scholarships for any men who'd like to go. Uh, if you need some financial help, just let me know. Do not let money be an issue for you to go and hang out with some men, have uh, Jesus poured into you as we worship together with men from this whole Northwest and, and, and primarily this community here. Uh, there'll be a, a great group of guys. Come talk to me after service today, and we'll get you signed up, okay? Uh, fishing trip. I told you I was a good member, Steve. The annual fishing trip uh, and camp out is coming up the last weekend in July. If you don't like being in Tri-Cities during race weekend because it's really crowded, and guys, if you'd like to go fishing and hang out and camp with other guys from our church, uh, we invite you to sign up. There's a sign-up sheet out in the foyer. We are joining up with the Hermiston Church of the Nazarene this year, and they're bringing seven or eight boats. Am I being muted? Is that in there? Okay. Uh, so we got lots of boats this year. There's going to be lots of guys. We're going to have a great time. Uh, we catch fish. We fry fish. We eat fish. We sit around and talk and have a great time, and we repeat. Right? That's about how it goes, right? It's a very relaxing weekend on the river, okay? So the sign-up sheet's out before you. You can talk to Steve if you'd like more information. I think that about covers the primary things that have been going on in the life of the church right now and coming up very quickly. Uh, so moving on to Galatians. Uh, you have your device, your Bible, open up Galatians chapter 1. Uh, we're going to look at the second half of the first chapter today. And we're going to start off by looking at the theme for this book. We have a theme for Old Thessalonians. We also have a theme for this book. And it's this. We, we began this last week. Uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ creates a new multi-ethnic family of God that truly transforms people through the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. Last week, uh, we dug into the why of this letter, uh, why it was written, why Paul started this letter. He started a good work in Galatia, uh, he got churches planted, people converted, the movement is growing, uh, he trained some leaders, and then just like he did in all of his other locations, he moved on to plant some more churches. And he left it in the good hands of the leaders in Galatia, uh, and off he went. In comes some good, well-intentioned Jewish Christians uh, who tell this new Gentile Christian group in Galatia, this is Central Turkey, modern-day Central Turkey, uh, they tell them that Paul doesn't really know what he's talking about. He's got parts of it, but there's more to it if they really want to be Christians, okay? If they really want to be Christians and follow after Jesus, then they just got to be Jewish, right? We talked about this last week, and to be Jewish, you had to follow the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, which included the Levitical Law, the Ten Commandments. Um, things like they had to get circumcised if they weren't already all Gentiles weren't so they needed to get circumcised all the guys uh, they couldn't eat unclean animals which meant no bacon <laughs> and they had to observe the Sabbath no work on the Sabbath okay uh, and you were their slaves nobody and, and that's just a, a short list of the many things that you had to do as a Jew and these good Jewish Christians who were Messianic Jews, they believed that Jesus was the Messiah. But they also believed that you had to be Jewish in order to be a Christian and you had to follow all the rules. So Paul comes back and he says, uh, no, this is not the way it is. Uh, he tells the Jewish, or sorry, the, the Christians in Galatia, these, these Gentile Christians, he says to them uh, in the first nine verses, I'm pretty confused as to why you've gone astray so quickly from what I told you originally, from the gospel that was preached to you. And he calls down curses from God. What a way to start a life. He calls down curses from God on those who have led the people astray, <coughs> even on himself if he preaches a gospel other than what was revealed to him by Jesus. 
That's powerful stuff, folks. And uh, this was not the touchy-feely congratulations. You guys are doing amazing at Thessalonians. This is a slap across the face, a shot across the bow, a wake-up call to the Galatian church and to the Jewish Christians that were there. So let's dig in. Paul's letter to the churches in Galatia, uh, starting at verse 10 of chapter 1. All right, I'm reading out of the NIV, and it says this. Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preach is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age. Among my people, I was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, my immediate response was not to consult any human being. I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went into Arabia, and later I returned to Damascus. Father God, we pray that uh, through the reading of your word and the presence of your Holy Spirit this morning, that we would hear and know your truth. And we pray that in a, in a very confusing time about truth, God. We pray that you would... Uh, take our perceptions out, uh, take our uh, ideas about what truth is, and God, we pray that you would fill us with your truth in actuality, in reality, that you would fill us with your truth, that we would know that we know that the gospel of Jesus Christ is here, is alive, the good news, transforming people because of your grace, because of your mercy. And we pray, God, that as we would walk out of this room uh, in a few minutes, that you would put ash into our hands and feet, that this gospel would become real to us and in us, and that lives would be transformed because of what you're doing in and through us. And we pray this in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. So I have a question for you this morning. What is truth? Somebody want to just not guard that thing on the screen. Tell me what you think truth is. <coughs> what is truth? Wow. We've got our work cut out for us today. <laughs> this is a scary topic. There's a reason why nobody's saying anything because who, who wants to say that they know what truth is and be singled out? Who would offend? <coughs> who would be offended? Right? What is truth? Uh, I I think of Paul's job as, as an apostle, as a sent one, that's what apostle means, to the Gentiles to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he, throughout his whole life, was on a journey of truth, of seeking truth, of seeking who Jesus is in his life, and sharing that with as many people as he possibly could. That's his job in a nutshell, on a journey to discover truth and to share truth. And that's a lifelong journey, folks. Uh, so I would say uh, truth. What is truth? Where does truth come from? Anybody want to gander that one? Jesus? Yeah. <laughs> the Bible? Okay, but a couple of you have the Bible. The heart, the heart yeah. Okay, if we want to get specific, John 8, 32. Okay. Yeah. Is it worth our time to search for truth? Yeah. Thank you! Because <laughs> if it's not, folks, we can just pack up and go. <laughs> it is worth our time to search for truth, but i got to tell you, folks, it's hard work. Searching for truth, sifting through the world, is hard work trying to find uh, truth. Truth, that is truth. Okay. Uh, how long does it take to find truth? Have any of you achieved ultimate enlightenment yet? 
I was taking a phrase from a different religion. Ah, folks, it takes a while, doesn't it? In, in some, it's a lifelong journey. In some, it's a blink of an eye. Because God can entirely sanctify you like that. And then God can also take his time and slow cook like a good brisket. Amen. Yeah. Took a brisket yesterday for almost 11 hours. It was amazing. <laughs> Either way, God's sanctifying work, his truth, himself, is at work in us in a process. Right? Truth. Well, I had to look it up. I always like looking things up, especially words. <coughs> Truth, uh, the de definition of Webster's Dictionary, uh, Merriam-Webster's Dictionary, the body of real things, events, and facts. Actuality is the word I highlighted that you can write in your notes. Or the state of being the case. Fact. Actuality or fact. That is truth. Okay? What is actual, uh, what is fact, what is reality. There's just one problem, folks. Humans can't agree on what actuality and fact is. Okay. This has brought us a new definition for truth in Merriam-Webster's Dictionary. Let me read it for you. It says, a judgment, proposition, or idea that is true or accepted as true. Meaning, if you can get enough people to agree that my guitar is purple, it will be true. According to Webster's Dictionary. Because truth, and this is where we're at in the state of the world today, folks. Truth isn't really truth anymore. If you get enough people to accept that it is, well, that's true. It's all relative, isn't it? Paul's on this journey to share actual truth, and folks, that's, it's our journey as well. And it's a tough one. To talk to people about Jesus is hard work because we mess it up because we're human. Okay? And the reality and the, and the fact of it is many of us are so terrified about following in Paul's footsteps and, and evangelize where he's talking to people about Jesus that we just don't do it. We're so terrified about messing it up. We're so terrified about misspeaking and saying something that isn't right or isn't true, so we just don't do any of it at all. Can you imagine if Paul felt the same way? Where would the church be today? If he didn't just go and boldly proclaim and live Jesus Christ. And that's it. This is why he shares with these Gentiles and these Jews. It's not about being circumcised. It's not about not eating bacon. It's not about keeping the Sabbath. It's about Jesus Christ. Amen. And the gospel of Jesus Christ, the death and resurrection of Jesus, made a way for all of humanity to become Christians, to be followers of Jesus Christ. Now those things are good things. And you can respond to the grace that God has given you in salvation by doing those things, by asking him to sanctify you and make you holy and set you apart. And if that means not eating bacon, <coughs> and if it means being circumcised, if it means uh, not using profane language, and if it means dressing a certain way, all these things, whatever the rules are, whatever God would work with you, how you respond to the gift that's been given, that's something entirely different. It's like, guys, Miguel, the gift of salvation has one requirement. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, confess it with your lips, and you will be saved. Amen. It is simple, and it is open to anyone. Paul's on this journey to share actual truth, not man's truth, God's truth. He has come into the region of Galatia and begun a good work, and, and he is planting churches and sharing truth about what was revealed to him from Jesus. But his opponents have come in after him and are spreading their version of the truth. This, this happens all the time, folks. It's one of the reasons why we have denominations. We interpret God's word just a little differently, all of us. Okay? Spreading their version of the truth, these Jewish Christians, they have been telling the Galatians that Paul has tailored his gospel to please people. Okay? Uh, picture these good Jewish, good intentions, Christians, following the Torah, the Levitical law, the Ten Commandments, they've got it all together. Right. 
And they think that everyone who wants to be a Christian needs to fully convert to Judaism, uh, obey all those commands, do all those things. And these Jews falsely believe that Paul has cheapened the gospel. That since these Gentiles aren't circumcised, that Paul has created a half gospel in order to please people and become famous. They feel like Paul has made it easy to become a Christian when it should be very, very hard. These Jews also believe that Paul has failed his job of preaching the true gospel and, and fully converting these Gentiles, but I gotta tell you, this isn't the truth. These opening nine verses we talked about last week in the letter uh, make it quite clear that this isn't how Paul operates. I mean, you have to understand, he called down curses from God upon anyone who would preach to his brothers and sisters a false gospel, including himself. He believed that he had the true gospel, and he believed and was in it only for the truth, and Jesus is truth. Starting with verse 10, let's take a look at these verses. Galatians 1, verse 10. It says this, Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Uh, or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. So in this we see that Paul is in it for God and in it for Jesus. He's not trying to please people. i got to tell you, not many people like those who call down curses from God upon them. Not a party favorite, okay? Anybody? Anybody would be willing to call that person your best friend? <laughs> the guy that calls down curses from God on you? He, he's not in it to please people, folks. He's not in it to make friends. He's in it to introduce Jesus to a whole new world and get them the truth so that their lives can be transformed, okay? After nine verses of introduction and explanation and calling down God's curses, he asks this first question this morning. Does it seem like I'm trying to please people, or does it seem like I'm trying to please God? Here's a hint. And I've said it multiple times, but he wouldn't be calling down curses upon people or himself if he was trying to please people. But if he was pointing to the true gospel, and claiming for all to hear, and to God. If anyone should share or preach a gospel other than the gospel of Jesus Christ, may God curse them. I think that's fairly pleasing to God. It lifts Jesus up. So my question to you today, the first of four, my question to you today, who, who are you trying to please? Who in this world are you trying to gain the attention of? Who are you trying to catch the eye of? And all that you do, who are you trying to impress? Who are you trying to make happy? Many of you have learned a lesson along the way in your life that you truly can't make other people happy. You've tried over and over and over again. You've almost killed yourself trying to make other people happy, and it just doesn't work. Some people just don't like being happy. Some people don't care what you do to make them happy. Who is it that you're trying to please in this world? This might be a hurdle for you in your walk. It might be a hurdle in, in, in getting to know who Jesus is, getting closer to him. If you're trying to please somebody other than God, if you're trying to please somebody other than Jesus in this world, that person's got your devotion, your attention. It's not Jesus, it's not God. So a little self-examination for you today. Who are you trying to please? Moving on to verse 11 and verse 12. It says this, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I, I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. So Paul moves from this challenge, this question, to assuring his brothers and sisters that he did not receive the gospel, uh, the good news about Jesus and what happened, from any human being. Okay? He did this because the Jews were trying to say that he did receive it from other human beings. If he did receive it from them, I gotta tell you, Paul probably would have talked about some, some pieces and bits about uh, bacon and circumcision and all those sorts of things. But he didn't. 
Instead, he received the good news by revelation from Jesus Christ. And, and then just to make sure they understand that it really truthfully was Jesus and how impractical and impactful that is, he reminds them his meaning. So my question, uh, my next question for you too, question two out of the Who are you receiving the gospel from? Who are you receiving the good news from? I say that knowing full well that I'm standing up in front of all of you talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ. So it's a good thing for a church to have a pastor. It's a good thing for a church to have a sheepdog, okay, to share some of the gospel, to point you in the right direction. But that's not the end all for it. You see, here's the deal. I might get mistaken from time to time. I'm human. You've got to know your word. So maybe it's the word you get your gospel from. You get some help, some uh, maybe some analogies and some things like that from a person like me. But maybe you should go to the word that transforms, the word of God, to hear the gospel, to read the gospel. Because it is a living word. It transforms us. It, it, it shakes our foundations of who we are, who we think we are. Maybe you would go a bit further and you'd just say, could I listen to the Holy Spirit tell me the gospel through the word and then through a guy that has run it? Folks, it's so important to have a relationship with God himself, to listen to the quiet voice of the Holy Spirit tell you the good news about Jesus, how it's impacting and changing your life, and how it can impact and change other people. And the Holy Spirit uses other people. And the Holy Spirit uses the word of God. The Holy Spirit can use anything to touch you and to get you the good news of Jesus Christ. Who are you receiving the gospel from, the good news? Because I'll be the first to say, folks, if you just rely solely upon me, it's not going to get where you I'm not that good, okay? No preacher is. And any who claim to be, watch out. The Holy Spirit of God is the preacher you need to listen to. Amen. So who are you receiving the gospel from? So Paul, he uh, sets out to assure uh, the folks that he didn't receive the gospel from man, but received it from Jesus. And then he sets out to help them understand, to make his point so that they understand that it really, truly was Jesus, how impactful that was to him. He reminds them, his brothers and sisters, who he was from the very start. He reminds them. Paul's a Pharisee, folks. And he does not hide it. And that is very powerful. Very impactful, okay? He is a Pharisee. Let's look at verse 13 and verse 14. <coughs> Paul reminds his brothers and sisters who he was from the start. He was a Pharisee. So starting at verse 13, it says, For you have heard of my previous life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. Folks, that is an understatement. He was set out to kill every person who was part of the way, known as the way, the church. Those who believed Jesus was the Messiah. He had letters to take to synagogues to bring people in and to kill them. Okay? That was his chief job. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. That is also an understatement. Extremely zealous and devoted to, to the traditions of Judaism. He, Paul, was the perfect Pharisee. So a little background on Paul. Paul grew up with the uh, with role models, just like every good boy does, okay? But he didn't have role models like football or baseball or basketball stars or, or rock musicians or any of those things. Little Jewish boys like Paul, uh, their minds were fed with oral history and tales of the great leaders of Israel. Those who were prophets, okay? That was the hero of a little boy that was Jewish, the prophet of Israel, who shared God's word no matter the cost. 
uh, the martyred, those who died, who lived and died in obedience to God's word and in obedience fearlessly for their God and his law. They lived and died for it. They breathed it. These are the role models that Paul had. Paul describes himself as one of those who were the strictest in following the rules and traditions as well as, as achieving higher education. He spoke multiple languages. Paul was a Pharisee and one of the strictest ones that ever lived. And his life is given the task to clean up the nonsense of Jesus in the church. Paul's role model was uh, the prophet Elijah himself. Uh, Elijah. Elijah was a man of fire. He called down fire on soldiers sent to seize him. And one of my favorite stories, he, he called down fire on the prophets of Baal, if you remember back in the Old Testament books we don't often read, most of us. He's being chased all over by Jezebel. He's trying to remain true to the word of God. He's doing a great, great job of it. The prophets of Baal challenge him. and He challenges them. They get up on a mountain. They build the great altars. And he says, you pray to your God and see if he'll bring God's fire down. And for days, the prophets of Baal preached and prayed and wailed and danced and did everything they possibly could. And Elijah made fun of them. He poked jokes at them. Pray louder, he said. And he's sitting by himself with his altar. They got like 900 prophets over there dancing around their altar. And then one of the most powerful prayers in the Old Testament, he calls down the fire of God. And on an altar that was soaked in rain, a pillar came. And the entire altar was engulfed. <clears throat> this is Paul's role model. A man of God who was so obedient to God, who was so close with God in a relationship that he could call down fire from God. This is Paul's role model. Paul ravaged the church. He felt it's his primary job to rid Israel, I'll say it again, of this nonsense. Of Jesus as Messiah. But in Galatians 1, 15 and 16, the first part of 16, we see a transformation in Paul. He tells them who he was and he reminds them because they know the story. He doesn't hide it. But then we see a transformation. It says, but when God who set me apart from my mother's room and called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, Paul was stopped in his tracks by truth itself. Jesus. I want to read for you. I just want to listen. I want you to listen uh, to Acts chapter 9. And I'm, I'm going to read it from the message. You can see here's some uh, paraphrase of scripture. It's so powerful, folks. Listen to the story of Paul meeting Jesus. At this point, he's Saul. Uh, Saul of Tarsus. Uh, Acts chapter 9. All this time Saul was breathing down the necks of the master's disciples out for the kill. He went to the chief priests and got arrest warrants to, make, to take to the meeting places in Damascus so that if he found anyone there belonging to the way, whether men or women, he could arrest them and bring them to Jerusalem. He set off, and when he got to the outskirts of Damascus, he was suddenly dazed by a blinding flash of light. As he fell to the ground, he heard a voice, Saul, Saul, why are you out to get me? He said, Who are you, Master? I am Jesus, the one you're hunting down. I want you to go up and enter the city, and the city you'll be told what to do next. His companions stood there dumbstruck. They could hear sounds, but they couldn't see anyone, while Saul, picking himself up off the ground, found himself stone blind. They had to take him by the hand and lead him into Damascus. He continued blind for three days. He ate nothing, and he drank nothing. There was a disciple in Damascus by the name of Ananias. 
The master spoke to him in a vision. Ananias, yes, master, he answered. Get up and go over to Straight Avenue. Ask at the house of Judas for a man, named, uh, man from Tarsus. His name is Saul. He is there praying. He was, has just had a dream in which he saw a man named Ananias enter the house and lay hands on him so he could see again. Ananias protested. Master, you can't be serious. Everybody's talking about this man and the terrible things he's been doing. His reign of terror against your people in Jerusalem. And now he's shown up here with papers from the chief priests that give him license to do the same to us. But the master, God, said, don't argue. Go. I have picked him as my personal representative to the Gentiles and kings and Jews. And now I'm about to show him what he's in for, the hard suffering that goes with the job. Can you imagine being Ananias? You have this discussion with God, and God, and, and you're just laying it out. It's a, God doesn't know who Saul is and how many people he's killed. Okay? And, and Ananias lays it out, and, and God says, Don't argue with me. Just go. Okay? I've chosen Saul as my representative to the Gentiles and the kings and the Jews. Can you imagine this? Any of you ever had a mother say, don't argue with me, just do it? <laughs> I think I heard that yesterday. <laughs> so Ananias went and found the house, placed his hands on blind Saul and said, Brother Saul, the master has sent me. The same Jesus you saw on your way from here, he sent me so you could see again. And he filled and be filled with the Holy Spirit. No sooner were the words out of his mouth than something like scales fell from Saul's eyes. He could see again. He got to his feet, was baptized, and sat down with them to a hearty meal. This is God's story in Saul's life, Paul's life. It is his transformation. It's the gospel lived out in the life, the heart and mind of Paul himself, Jesus Christ, at work. So my question for you today on this, this third opportunity question, are you allowing God to stop you in your tracks? Are you allowing God to blind you to your plan, to your ideas, to your dreams, your wishes, your visions, so that he could anoint you to his dreams for you, his visions for you, his plans for you. And if you feel like, I've been blind for a long time, I've just been waiting and waiting. Maybe the question changes a little bit to, have you asked God to pull the scales off your eyes? Have you prayed for sanctification? Have you prayed for that next big step? God, would you just do with me whatever you're going to do with me? I am yours. I'm fully yours. After Jesus is revealed to him, Paul has a response. It's in the second half of verse 16 and the beginning of uh, 17. Galatians uh, 1, 16b and 17. My immediate response was not to consult any human being. But once he had been prayed over, the scales fell off. He had some, some work to do. And his immediate response, he says, was not to consult any human being. I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went into Arabia, and later I returned to Damascus. His immediate response was not to consult any human being. It was to consult God. But let me tell you why. Uh, here, Paul's journey follows his role model, Elijah, okay? The prophet. Paul says he went into Arabia and then later returned to Damascus. And I need you to follow me on here for a minute. Arabia is where Mount Sinai is or Horeb in, in uh, some of the translations that you have. And Mount Sinai is where Elijah went to meet with God 
in a particularly dark part of his own journey. It's in 1 Kings 19. Elijah has killed all the prophets of Baal. That story I told you. He brought down fire upon the altar of God and then upon the prophets of Baal. And King Ahab tells Jezebel to hunt down Elijah and kill him, and he flees to Horeb or Mount Sinai. And God appears to Elijah there in a very powerful way. He's on the mountain, and a great wind comes in that rushes, and it's so loud, but it says, the word says, it, God wasn't in the wind. And then a great earthquake came and shook the whole mountain, and it shook Elijah to his core, but God, but God wasn't in the earthquake. And then fire came, but God wasn't in the fire. And then Elijah heard a whisper, and it was God. So Paul follows his role model, Elijah, as he says he goes into Arabia and most likely set off to Mount Sinai after being stopped and trapped by Jesus, now his Lord and Savior. And he goes to Mount Sinai to consult with God. What better place if he's going to live after his role model? One who is so devout and so close in relationship with God. What better place to meet God than there? And then he returns to Damascus and he begins his journey of sharing the truth of Jesus to everyone he can. Because the death and resurrection of Jesus meant that all humanity now had access to God. So my last question for you is this. Who do you consult when God reveals his plan to you? Do you consult anyone? I mean, for most humans, when God reveals something to them, they get so freaked out. <coughs> they don't talk to anybody about it. Because most of the time, <laughs> it's something that they don't want it to be. <laughs> most of the times, it's something that's so scary to them they can't even picture themselves going anywhere near it. But God says, this is my plan. A good, pleasing, perfect plan. <coughs> Who do you consult when God reveals his plan to you? Do, you? do you consult God? Do you say, God, you are out of your mind. When I told you I was never going to go there, I meant I was never going to go there, and God said, don't need that plan. Do you talk to your pastor? Some of you do. Do you talk to your discipleship partner? Do you have a discipleship partner? <coughs> do you talk to your spouse? Who are you talking to in order to take the next steps of God's plan for your life? Or do you just not consult and hope and pray that it will just go away? We're all different, aren't we? Every one of us. The Puritans had a saying once long ago, God does not break all hearts in the same way. But his heartbreaking is at the center of every Christian journey. It's a life that we must live that everybody needs from time to time to wrestle privately with God and his great will for our lives and to wrestle publicly with God and his great will for our lives. Paul did both. He wrestled privately, he wrestled publicly. He did not hold back about who he was. He is passionate about proclaiming the truth, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and in its most simplest form, that God sent his son to die for you and me and all people, past, present, future, and in that gracious act, he made a way for all humanity. Not just his chosen kids, Jews, but also Gentiles, like everybody else, you and me. That all would have a way to the Father through the Son. And Jesus died once for all, so that we would have it. There's no magic formula, folks. Again, Paul uh, says, confess in your heart and on your lips that Jesus Christ is Lord and you will be saved. 
So back to these questions as we close. Who are you trying to please? Who in your life are you trying to impress or catch the eye of? Who are you trying to make happy? Is it God? And God alone? Because that's hard. Are there others to distract you? Who are you receiving the gospel from? And I'll remind you, you can tell me from time to time. Not every time, just time to time. <laughs> I'm not that good. So folks, I beg you, do not just listen to me for a half an hour, 40 minutes on a Sunday morning and, and hope that the rest of your week will go great. The gospel of Jesus is so much more than a Sunday morning message. Who is speaking to you? Who are you receiving the gospel from? Are you allowing God to stop you in your tracks and blind you to your plan so that he can peel the scales off and show you his great and mighty and awesome plan for your life that brings him glory? And who do you consult about what God is doing in your life? My prayer is that you consult him. Whether on a mountaintop, I mean, that's where I love to be when I talk with God out in the wilderness. But maybe for you, it's just at a quiet place in your own house, your own apartment. Kneeling at your bedside. Sitting on your couch. Sitting out uh, under some trees with some flowers as the ducks go by. Watching clouds. Who do you consult? I'd like you to stand with me this morning. I want to give you an opportunity to speak into these questions that I've asked you this morning. Or maybe pause for a second on one of them or all of them. I want to offer an opportunity for you to just come down to this altar and maybe ask God some questions of your own.